There's nothing fascinating about this girl except that she's gone. What has she done? You don't know your subject. She's a nothing. Who is she there to you? There are dozens and dozens of girls like this littering campuses across the country. Lonely girls who cannot make the world see them. Do not tell me I do not know this girl. Don't you dare. What is up, guys? Welcome back to another episode of the CNA Critique. I hope everyone's staying safe out there. Today, I'm going to be going over the beginning, middle, and end to this gothic drama of a movie. It's called Shirley. It's a movie that flew under the radar like a lot of other movies coming out during this crazy time. But it's a movie I'm excited to break down nonetheless. <laughs> My dear. There's not enough scotch in the world for that one. <laughs> Shirley, what are you writing now? A little novella. I'm calling none of your goddamn business. <laughs> so Shirley stars Elizabeth Moss, who has easily had the best year of any actor or actress in 2020. I know this might not be saying too much, but if the Oscars actually take place early next year, Elizabeth Moss is easily a shoo-in for best actress. She not only has the critical and box office success of The Invisible Man, but now she has what is arguably the best VOD and streaming platform release during this quarantine period. I'm of course referring to Shirley. It's based on the famous horror writer Shirley Jackson who finds inspiration for her next book after she and her husband take in a happily married couple. The movie starts off with a young woman named Rose played by Odessa Young. Her husband Fred just got invited to guest speak at a lecture that's being hosted by Stanley Hyman who just so happens to be the husband of famous writer Shirley Jackson. On the way to that lecture we see that Rose just finished reading Shirley's latest short story titled The Lottery which within the context of this movie has proven to be Shirley's most provocative and divisive story yet. This story seems to have touched a nerve with Rose because within seconds of Rose finishing the book, her and her husband Fred are knocking boots in the train bathroom. Now this relationship that we initially see between Rose and Fred differs greatly from the relationship they encounter once they get to Shirley and Stanley's house. Shirley and Stanley, they fight constantly and with ruthless aggression too. They're one of those couples that take satisfaction in being as mean as possible to one another if that phone rings one more time during dinner Stanley so help me I'm going to take care of it myself I'm well within the bounds of our agreement ah. hmm. our agreement didn't include sluts interrupting my dinner it becomes pretty clear early on that Fred and Rose's short business trip is going to turn into something a little bit more permanent. Since Stanley is barely home, he asks Rose if she can keep his wife company in exchange for free rent. Since Shirley hasn't left the house in over two months and is in the middle of writing her next novel. As the film goes along, we see the relationship between Rose and Shirley slowly evolve from being total strangers into a relationship built on trust and codependence. Rose looks to Shirley as a mentor and respects her writing ability, but Shirley sees Rose more in a romantic light, looking for love in Rose that she isn't getting in her own marriage with Stanley. But interestingly enough, the more and more time these two ladies spend together, the more the two appear to trade places. As the movie goes along, Shirley, who at the beginning of the movie is a total mess, starts to get her life back in order, while Rose, who had her life together in the beginning of the movie, starts to spiral out of control. It's as if Shirley, needing life of her own to write her novel, is using Rose as her own personal energy source to feed off of. Eventually, the film fast forwards a year, Stanley finally realizes that his wife is more into Rose than she is into him, and decides it's time for Rose and Fred to be on their way and find their own home. Rose doesn't take this too kindly though and tries to frame Stanley as the man Paula might be sleeping with. And since Stanley is a known womanizer and adulterer, Rose thinks it'll be an easy job to get Shirley to turn on him. That plan backfires though as Shirley knew all along what kind of piece of shit her husband Stanley was and ends up turning the tables on Rose. Little did Rose know her husband Fred was also cheating on her too. Rose ends up confronting Fred about this revelation and Fred admits his infidelity and this is when the movie really gets interesting. We're given what seemingly appears to be two separate endings leaving the audience to decide what happens. In the first ending, we see Rose leave the Hyman Jackson house in a car with Fred who tells her everything in due time will go back to normal. However, Rose has other plans. Everything will be back to normal. No, 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 no. 
I'm not going back to that. In the film's second ending, we see Shirley and Rose standing on the edge of the cliff Paula Jean Walden was rumored to have jumped off of years earlier until suddenly Rose disappears completely. It's left open to interpretation what actually happens to Rose. Did she jump? Did she just follow Shirley's advice and go off with her husband? Did she actually exist at all? The movie ends with Shirley finally getting the validation she was seeking from her husband all along, who praises her new novel. A novel he swore she couldn't write at the beginning of the film. It's a novel. Oh no, dear, that's... You're not... You're just not up to it. I don't think this movie was meant to have one clear cut ending. In real life, Shirley Jackson was a writer who liked to write about the experiences of women. And I think that's what director Josephine Decker tried to do here with the ambiguous ending and representation of women. One ending, you see Rose so overwhelmed with life that she presumably jumps off of a cliff. In another version, you see Rose in the car with her husband, determined to come out of the experience stronger and more independent than ever before. This movie leaves us with an intended sense of uncertainty, allowing everyone who watches to have their own unique viewing experience. This movie is a slow burn gothic drama with some psychological horror elements as well, and it was a movie I enjoyed quite a bit, even if it's too art house for more mainstream audiences. I'm gonna give this movie a 8.4, it's easily Josephine Decker's best directorial movie to date. But alright guys, thanks for watching another episode of The Scene Critique. If you like this episode, please subscribe for more explanations and breakdowns like this one. Remember, movies may fade, but real legends never fade.